بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الحمد لله we're making it to the last segment of the day a day that has been packed الحمد لله by beneficial reminders and thought-provoking workshops from our many guests الحمد لله from الدكتور الشيخ الياس كرماني to my right to our very own الشيخ محمد علي to my left and also the other mashayikh and asati that are pres that may Allah Azza wa Jal bless them, Amen. bless us with their presence, such as our brother Ustad Imran Hussain, who would have loved to stay, but he had to get a train back to London, and also our Ustad, Ustad Hisham Jafar Ali. Now, Alhamdulillah, we've made it to the last segment of the day, and today and tomorrow we are going to be having a continuation of discussing these topics, the, the issues of the Muslims or the challenges that Muslims face in the West. And just a quick rundown of tomorrow's program before inshallah we get into this. As you know that we start the day between Salat al-Duhur and Salat al-Asr by two workshops. Tomorrow's workshops are Islam and LGBT. And the second workshop is about raising righteous children. And I only mention these because I just a reminder that there are only four or five places left at the Raising Righteous Children workshops for the brothers because the sisters one is sold out and packed out. And also for the second workshop, we only have three places remaining, inshallah. So if you haven't signed up, it's alfurqanmcr.eventbrite.co.uk and you can sign up now because tomorrow, <coughs> today we managed to squeeze in a few more chairs, but tomorrow we might have to turn people away, unfortunately, and we don't want to do that. But inshallah, getting into this topic, oh sorry, tomorrow continuing after Salat al-Asr, we are going to have four talks by our Asatidah, as Sheikh Yusuf Patel, may Allah bless him, Ustad Yusuf Patel, Sheikh Abu Taymiyyah, and our Dr. Sajid Umar, who will be visiting this masjid, I think for the first time, if I'm not mistaken, and a man that's been uh, evading us for a little while, our Ustad, the Sheikh Abu Usama, Hafizahullah. I just spoke to him an hour ago, he just landed back from Umrah, but he said he's excited to come here, inshallah, and this is going to be his first public appearance back since he's come back. And then inshallah we're going to be having a panel discussion where we have our very Sheikh, Sheikh Muhammad Ali, Ustad Abu Taymiyyah and Sheikh Abu Usama discussing the challenges of the West to conclude the conference. As you've seen, there is a QR code that there are questions and answers or we said questions that we try to answer. However, we try to keep the topic to Islam in the 21st century. And if the questions that are relevant, I've drafted them in. A majority of the questions that were not related to this topic Inshallah, I am going to try and get an exclusive Q&A session with Sheikh Muhammad Ali for our viewers. So you can put your questions, Inshallah, on the, on the form, on the link, and we will get the answers from the Sheikh on a one-to-one -one sit down, Inshallah. Islam and the 21st century. Throughout time, Islam has been prominent and Islam will always be prominent from when Allah Azza wa Jal sent that message to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the cave. Over time, Islam has gone through its ups and Islam has gone through its downs and the Muslims have faced many challenges. I wanted to start by asking and perhaps asking Dr. Elias first, is Islam progressing currently or is it regressing? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Now, this question of Islam in the 21st century, this question, interestingly, is always being proposed. And the way I always answer this question is interestingly like this. If we imagine 100 years ago, two people, they stood here and they said, life is changing very quickly. And there are people today standing here who said, life is not the same anymore. And in 100 years time, there will be two people, they will stand here and they will say, life is constantly changing. And this is the reality. There is constant change. There is change taking place. But for the mu'min, we have to remain upon a constant. We have to have istiqamah. We cannot react to everything around the world. And this is what Allah says in the Quran. Fastakim kama umirat. He has commanded you to have istiqama. The Prophet ﷺ told us, Amantu billahi thumma stakim. Believe in, believe in Allah. Say, I believe in Allah. Thereafter, remain firm. There's a beautiful verse in the Quran. Waqalu rabbun Allah thumma stakamu. Tatanazzalu alayhimul malaika. Alla takhafu. Wala tahzanu. Wa abshiru bil jannati illati kuntum tu'adun. Verily, those people who say, My Rabb is Allah. Thumma stakam. Thereafter, are firm. Do not change. Remain firm upon the reason that they have been created. Upon them, that person will come, the angel of death. 
And they will say, La takhafu, la tahzanu. Do not fear, do not grieve, but receive the glad tidings of paradise which you have been promised. May Allah Ta'ala bestow this upon us, inshallah. Ameen. Ameen. Istiqama. Unfortunately, today, maybe one of the biggest challenges, and what causes this istiqama is to be upon a firm foundation. You know, and that firm foundation is nothing other than our aqidah. This is the thing. And Allah Ta'ala says in that, this is the trustworthy handle that will never break. Unfortunately, this is what is being weakened at the moment. So, the simple answer to the question is that how is Islam dealing with all of this change and all of this flux and all of this changing in the outward manifestation? Outwardly, the society will always change. But what concerns the heart of the believer and what concerns us maintaining istikama never changes. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ came to establish. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a very simple surah. Imam Shafi'i rahimullah, he said regarding this simple surah, short surah, that this is enough by way of explaining to us everything we need to know in terms of our purpose. To give a, you know, to explain to us Islam. And that surah, surah as we know, most of us, surah al-asr. You know, by time, all time, every zaman of time, every era of time, my time from the beginning of my time to the end of my time on this earth. Brothers, that's all that really matters. It doesn't matter what's going to happen in a hundred years of time. What matters is your time from the beginning to the end. To die as Muslim. You know, to have these ahsan wa That's all that matters. And this is the meaning of that verse. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi ra'jun. From Allah we have come to Allah we are returning. From this point now in our history to the end of our time which is written is a time period. What are you doing filling this time? That's the reality. There's a certain mindset of people saying, oh, this is changing and that's changing and this is changing. And they're reacting to the change all the time. And they don't have istiqama and firmness. In fact, they're going up and down. This is not the way of a believer is constant. This is the same. Everything is changing, but we must remain as a constant. And the qalb comes from the word taqallab. And it has this fluctuation, the piece of flesh in the body. If it's whole, the whole body. We've got to stop being these fluctuating Muslims. We have to maintain al-istiqama. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna al-insana lafi khusr. This is very, very serious because he's saying verily all mankind from the beginning to the end, all are heading towards destruction in every zaman of time and era of time. Except, and then in Allah's mercy, he tells us the exception to the rule, four characteristics. Those people who have firm faith know why they're upon this earth. As Luqman said to his son, Ya Bunaya, la tushrik billah, inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Oh my dear child, of all the knowledge that you need to have, have the knowledge that never make partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the worst of all wrongdoing. Iman, amilun salih, righteous actions. Wa tawasu bil haqqi wa tawasu bil sabr. And that we enjoin upon each other the haqq and we have sabr, istiqama, firmness upon it. Four characteristics. One concerns Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, iman. The other three are in this creation. The amilun salih, watawasu bil haqqi, watawasu bil sabr. And so in essence, the nature of Islam, believe in Allah, albir towards Allah, goodness, and then albir to the creation, to do good in this creation. This is our maqsad. This is our purpose. In every space, wherever you are, whatever you are doing, whichever country you are in, whatever environment you are in, whatever the social, political, cultural, technological reality of that environment, your maqsad doesn't change. Your purpose doesn't change. Yes, you, you know, Sharia and the maqasid of the Sharia and Ahkam al Qawaid, you know, there is flexibility in how we adapt the Islamic rulings to the environment that is done by the Fuqaha. But your maqsid and your purpose never ever changes. And so when you understand this, you do, we do not need to revise or this idea of progression. This is the deception of progression that shaitan does. That in every age, Things are getting better. But look at the hadith of the Prophet A time come except the zaman after is worse. Didn't say progression worse because we've gone away from the time. The best nation, the best ummah with the best deen. Allah has perfected, completed Islam upon khayra ummat ukhrijat nas. That was the pinnacle, my brothers. And since then we have deteriorated. And every zaman thereafter, time era thereafter, has a degeneration as they get further and further from al-ilm, from knowledge. 
So, what rectifies, as, as Imam Malik rahimullah said, nothing will cause the rectification of our time except what caused the rectification of the time of the Salaf. So that's it. Returning back to excellence. Return back to excellence. Don't think we're going forward. This is the deception of progression. That everything gets better. This is the ideologies of this postmodern society that says that as we gain more knowledge of science and technology and of the waqia, then we're able to control. No, no, no. But then you lost what really your maqsid and what your purpose is, which is fundamentally we are here for nothing other, brothers and sisters, yeah, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to live and die as Muslim. May Allah ta'ala make our end, inshallah, firmly upon Islam. Ameen. 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 <coughs> MashaAllah, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'een Just to add on to what Dr. Karmani has just said very eloquently, MashaAllah, he has summarized it in a very beautiful way May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him greatly for that, say Ameen I also want to take this opportunity uh, on behalf of the masjid, on behalf of this wonderful congregation uh, to thank from the bottom of our hearts uh, Dr. Karmani for accepting our invitation to come to our masjid and alhamdulillah to deliver the workshop which he has done today and also the talk that he has delivered and right now alhamdulillah participating uh, in this uh, alhamdulillah and uh, panel discussion that we are having. So Jazakallah Khair, uh, Shaykhana exactly. Muhammad Elias Karbani. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve you. Allahumma ameen. <laughs> and just to add on uh, to what he has just said, and one of the ayat that he has, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, completed or has ended with his, mashallah, beautiful uh, summarized answer was, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ And the question that our wonderful Ustaz Abu Ubaidah began with was, and Islam in the 21st century. Islam in the 21st century. And Islam at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu is exactly the same Islam. Is exactly the same Islam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. Our religion was complete from that moment. And it will remain complete until the end of time. Just the people, they're the ones who will change. So we will be here, some of us will be here. And we will be the Muslims of today. There will be people who will be the Muslims of tomorrow. There were people who were the Muslims of yesterday. And the way they act upon the religion and how they benefit from this amazing religion will differ. The Sharia is exactly the same. The fiqh might just change from time to time. The ulama might change their, their views in terms of fiqh related issues, depending on the environment and the timing and everything and the situation. But the Sharia, the principles of our Sharia will always remain fixed and the same. So dear brothers and sisters in Islam, I just want to remind you, we are in need of Islam. Islam is not in need of us. We have to remember that. Whether this is the 21st century or the 23rd century or the 25th century, it doesn't matter. We will always be in need of Islam. People who will exist after 100 years, people who will come into existence, existence in, in 200 years time from now on, those people will need Islam as much as we need Islam today. Subhanallah. And like, mashallah, Dr. Karmani has said, like, he reminded us the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ has said, مَا مِنْ زَمَنْ إِلَّا الَّذِي بَعْدَهُ أَشَرٌ مِنْهُ or كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم There's no time except the time that comes after it Will have more difficult things Or it will have evil, more evil than the one that, that was before it So dear brothers and sisters in Islam I just want to remind you Islam came to fix five things Islam came to protect five things for us The first thing that Islam came to protect is religion itself Islam protects our religion Number two, Islam protects life It protects life the third thing our religion protects is the aql. And that was something that, mashallah, Dr. Karmani was talking about today when it comes to drugs and issues like that and the mental health and so forth. And also Islam protects um, the integrity of the person or the lineage. And that's why we talked about relationships. And also finally, Islam protects our wealth. So these are five fundamental things that our beautiful religion protects for us and will be relevant for us today and it will be relevant tomorrow and the day after. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters in Islam, what I want to conclude in terms of this particular question, what I would like to just uh, add is, is just the following point. 
like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said to one of the companions when he came to him and said to him, Ya Rasulullah, and give me a wasiyah. Just give me an advice. And he said, said to him, Qul amantu billah, thumma staqim. Say, I believe in Allah, and then stay steadfast upon that path. And always to recite this dua, Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh Allah, the turn of the hearts. Ya Allah, keep my heart firm upon the belief of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, upon this amazing religion. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do that for all of us and for our families as well. Jazakumullah khair. Amin, amin. MashaAllah, beautiful answers. Islam stays as a constant. However, the times that we live in change. And one of the changes that we have in the 21st century, something that we spoke about earlier, is social media and the presence and the widespread of it. It's become a phenomena, it's the, the difficulty and it's the outward challenge of, or the number one challenge of the 21st century, or one of them. It's one of the things that changed life in this century. But I've noticed, mashallah, both of these are not on social media. Is there a reason? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Sheikh, I'll begin, inshallah, yeah. Uh, look, for me, I found, I abandoned, I stopped all social media about uh, 12 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. And I, and I found personally, it added zero value to my life. I found that I didn't miss it. I found that it didn't have any benefit for me personally. And actually I found the time that I was using it, I can spend much more on research, on teaching, on many other activities. And I, I really, I do not miss it at all. And then the other thing I found was with it is what, that you spend so much time on social media completely reacting to people's comments and everything. And, and really there is no value in this particular matter. Now look, I'm not saying that you should abandon social media, but look, there is a very interesting checklist that you can use. Does it make me make shirk with Allah or is it leading me in any way to kufr? Is it making me fall into bid'ah or against the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? Is it increasing my ahwa so that it causes me to fall into the kabair, the major sins? Is it causing me to fall into the minor sins, yeah, and wasting of, of time? Is it something which is taking me away from the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it something which is disrupting my relationships and hukuk al the rights of the creation? When you go through this checklist and you ask yourself honestly this checklist, you'll find that there are many, it is taking you away from the dhikr of Allah. It is increasing your ahwa that you fall into the ma'asi. It is doing it. I like football like many of us here. I do listen to football channels. And unfortunately, we have to ask ourselves this. Does it take us away from the dhikr of Allah? It does sometimes. Does it cause us to fall into bad habits sometimes? It does sometimes. So brothers all I'm, and sisters, all I'm saying is take, make, always hold yourself to account. Take a, you know, do your muhasibah, do your self-accountability. As Umar radiallahu said, take account of yourself before Allah takes account of yourself. So when you do use the social media, be honest with yourself. Take account of yourself and find out, am I falling into these matters? And if you are, then you need to control this behavior. And the last point here, I've said it in the earlier sessions, the social media has been designed to be addictive, to make you slaves of the social media. Because what they're really doing is selling to you in terms of the marketing they're selling you and directing you towards buying and, and having particular, you know, like I said, e needs in terms of goods. And, and they know exactly everything about your profile and how to sell it to you. So it creates addiction. And obviously, the, the, you know, you, are, you can't be one who is Abdullah, your ubudiyah, your submission to Allah is going to be affected if you are obviously, you know, an addicted to these particular matters. Sakhlah khair, Sheikh. Yes, and just to add on to, mashallah, what uh, Dr. Karmani has said, and definitely, as we all know, and there's no one that can really uh, disagree with this and what uh, the doctor has just said, in terms of uh, social media being a very addictive thing, and also is a, is a sword which is a, is a double-edged sword. We can use it for something which is beneficial, alhamdulillah, for spreading the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can use it for that. But always remember, you know, shaitan, when he wants to mislead you, he will use a lot of different tactics. Among the tactics that he will use is like he's going to say to you, okay, be on social media, use it for good purposes. And then bit by bit, what he's going to do, like he did to our father, Adam alayhi salam and Hawa. At the beginning, you know, he didn't just say to them straight away, go and eat from that tree. He kind of like drew them closer to the tree bit by bit. And he told them why they should eat from the tree. 
And then after that, when he convinced them, that's when Adam alayhi salam and Hawa, our mother, when they have eaten from the tree. So shaitan can easily use the same techniques that he has used with our father and our mother, Adam, and also Hawa. So remember, inna shaitan lakum aduun fattakhidu aduwa. Indeed, shaitan is your enemy and take him as an enemy. He will use any form or any style or any type of thing that he can cause you to go away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can easily mislead you. And one of the ways, definitely one of the tools he has today is social media. I am not on social media like Ustaz uh, Zabu Ubaid has just said. And I have been asked to be on social media. When do you become, when, when, can, when will you be considered as someone who's on social media? <laughs> I, I need to actually understand that. <laughs> when you make TikTok, Sheikh. When I, when I have TikTok. Okay, I don't have TikTok. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not on social media. What else? When will I be considered somebody who's, who's on social media? I think you need to be established on two platforms. Which no. ones are they? Whichever two. You've got, you choose. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, so, TikTok. So I need to have my own account. Yeah. And have my own followers. Definitely. And, and then I have to post something every day. I just, I'm just trying to be your friend online. Shay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've been asked... Uh, by, I've been asked by many brothers, mashallah, not only within the UK, and I remember whenever I traveled around the world, I remember when I was somewhere in, for example, in Europe, for example, in Denmark or Norway or wherever I, I went, people would come, especially youngsters would come to me and say, and say to me, uh, Muhammad Ali, are you on social media? We want to follow you. And I say to them, no, I don't have social media. They, not even a single one said, I don't have any social media. I remember going to Nigeria and the Nigerian brothers coming to me and saying to Brother Muhammad Ali, are you on social media? I say to them, no, I don't have social media. <laughs> okay, some of them, they said, can we, can we actually establish one for you? I said to them, no, I don't want it. <laughs> I said to them, I don't want it. Like, like uh, mashallah, Dr. Karmani has said, what will happen is it will waste a lot of your time. Also, what you will do is you will compare yourself to other people. And there's going to be comparison. You'll try and compare what other people have and what you have, how many followers you have, how many likes do you have, how many this do you have, how many of that do you have. And we have been told, the Prophet ﷺ, one of the companions once came to him and he said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, give me advice. And the Prophet ﷺ gave him three important advices. The final advice he gave him was, Don't pay attention to what other people have. If you start comparing yourself to what other people have, this is exactly going to cause you so much pain and it's going to cause you so much stress and depression and sadness. And this is why we have so many people right now. And studies have shown people, for example, they might actually commit suicide because of social media. People are killing themselves and committing suicide because of social media pressures and this and that. SubhanAllah. How many people are committing so many sins due to social media? So remember all of that. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, Min husni islam al mar'i ma la ya'ni. Because a lot of us, SubhanAllah, we're wasting our times with things that do not concern us. Things that do not concern us. And these are very addictive things. You might watch something, a video, a particular video, and then that, will, that video will lead you to watch another one, and then a third one, and a fourth one, a fifth one. And within no time, you will see two, three hours of your time or two, three hours of your day have already gone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the harm of social media. Barakallah fikum. <clears throat> Sheikh, just one more quick point. Yeah. So what we have now is Web 3.0. The technology is constantly changing. In the next four or five years, we're moving towards AI, metaverse. We're working towards what we call uh, artificial intelligence related social media. We're moving towards deep fakes. And this is another reason. I, started, I came off social media when people started taking my videos and snipping them, just taking a one and a half hour video, taking 20 second comment, and then saying this person is saying this and this person is saying that. So people twist, distort, misuse this to misrepresent. Because we've got to remember, there is a big battle of ideas that are taking place in the online space. And, you know, you, you know, and people are twisting and distorting what you are saying as well. So there is a lot of you know, uh, fake news and there is a lot of fake, uh, or is it, uh, uh, you know, uh, deep, they call, they're calling it deep fakes, where people are being recorded their images, but then the, the words that are being used are being distorted or misrepresented or a completely different script. So this is the other reason. If you want to protect your reputation and you want to protect the integrity of what you say, then this is another reason to come off this social media because, you know, it, it is being totally misrepresented at the moment. And there are more effective ways we can use social media. And I think we have to actually, if anything, 
as a community, sit down and have a very, very informed discussion around identifying platforms which are of benefit and how to use this. For example, to do an audio podcast on a subject and then to, to, to uh, uh, disseminate that via, let's say, WhatsApp. That's a beneficial thing, I can see, people listening to an audio. Okay, but other platforms where, you know, you know, things such as TikTok and Snapchat and various other things, really, there is no way you can even use that platform, I think, as a beneficial learning tool. Allah knows best. Uh, I think as Sheikh mentioned about people snipping away a video and just using it. That's why you have to come to the source. You have to be authentic. You have to subscribe to Al-Furqan MCR's YouTube <laughs> and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat. Do we have Snapchat, TikTok? <laughs> to come inshallah But um, just going back to a more serious point That Sheikh Mohammed you mentioned about people Looking at what other people possess On, so on social media And is leading to depression Is leading to people's sort of um, Anxiety, people feeling Depressed, people feeling uh, Almost to a suicidal level And there's a rise On the mental health crisis Is this a fair statement to say uh, the, 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 research, the research is absolutely clear now that social media platforms have a direct impact in terms of the mental well-being of children and young people, their self-esteem, their body image, and is directly resulting in mental health problems and difficulties as they compare themselves to these unachievable standards. You have all of these body dysmorphia, anorexia, eating disorders, so many things, not just in the girls, but in the boys as well. You have also, you know, we call mimetic behavior where people imitate certain negative behaviors which are out there. And that in itself also has, you know, profound impact in terms of mental health. The research is absolutely clear. In fact, in America, there was a congressional hearing around TikTok and the evidence was presented around TikTok has a direct impact on the mental health of children and young people in America. So the research is very, very clear. This is a harmful thing. Now, this is the, this is the ajib thing about uh, the, the difference between when we talk about how forward thinking Islam is yeah, and we think that the Quran gives us everything by way of guidance that we need to deal with our social reality why was khamar made uh, haram because there is nafa'in there is benefit in this but the harm of it is far greater than any benefit so we have a simple principle where the harm is far greater than the benefit then obviously this is something impermissible the opposite principle agree we know and the society knows and government policy makers know social media is harmful but they do not control these mega corporations okay who are responsible for these projects. They're not controlling that because the revenues that they make on this is far greater than the benefit that it gives to human beings. They do not care about human beings, Yanni. If you look at all, you know, in my studies, if you look at the most harmful drugs that there are, and there is a whole range of drugs, okay, you know, from class A to class B, of all the drugs which are out there, the most harmful drug, the World Health Organization identifies as the drug which has the most impact in terms of pathology, yeah, in terms of disease causing, is alcohol and then tobacco the two ones which are legal you have so much harm for again why because the money that they make from the tax revenues and the corporations the billions that they make from this is far more important to them than the impact that it has on the human being islam is there for the welfare of human beings so where we see there is harm that is caused by these matters yeah then these things become impermissible for us so we have a totally opposite framework in terms of how we analyze it it is destroying young people and and i'm not even going to go in because there's youngsters here in the masjid you know what i predicted 10 years ago regarding how social media would be using in terms of uh, what we call the hypersexualization of children. This is harmful. Everyone realizes this is harmful for children now. Yet nobody is doing it. On a societal level, no one is doing it. And this is a role that we as Muslims have to actually give an alternative to the society. Okay. okay. <clears throat> and just to add on to the point with regards to the mental health issue. Alhamdulillah, as a masjid, as you can see, uh, the theme of our uh, conference this year, our uh, summer annual conference, uh, which 
is entitled Challenges of the West. And we have handpicked these particular matters, these particular issues, and because we know as a community, this is something that many of us are suffering from. Where when it comes to the issue of atheism, a lot of our youngsters are doubting the religion and doubting the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, we know there's almost, there's hardly any house right now which is free from someone who's struggling mentally. As imams, parents are always contacting us. And uh, Ustaz and Dr. Karmani, I'm sure he's gonna be, he can testify to this. He's always getting uh, calls from parents who are distraught. And, and some of the things that they will probably ask him about will be issues relating to the mental health of their own youngsters, like young teenagers, whether they're brothers or sisters. Everyone is suffering. Every family, every household, there's either one or two, or even more than that, where youngsters are suffering from mental health. And this is why we have said, inshallah ta'ala, our conference this year has to deal with these issues. Has to deal with these issues. Has to give some sort of guidance to the community how to deal with these issues. So Alhamdulillah, that's why we have invited, mashallah, the experts and mashallah, our wonderful mashayikh who have done, mashallah, research when it comes to these uh, topics, in-depth, mashallah, research. And Alhamdulillah, it's very important that we are hearing from them uh, rather than actually inviting someone who is a non-Muslim expert. But Alhamdulillah, we have Muslims who are expert, like Dr. Karbani, Jazakallah Khairan, who has talked about this topic, the topic of mental health uh, in a very beautiful way in, 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 in the workshop that he has delivered uh, today. And also, inshallah ta'ala, probably tonight, he will be t talking about these issues and hopefully give us some guidelines when it comes to how to deal with these issues. Barakallah fiqh. I think before coming to Dr. Elias, because I have actually a couple of questions or a few questions for you. Sheikh, one of the questions that came online, uh, maybe perhaps your best place to answer, is someone saying that if they are suffering from some of these uh, traumas and mental health uh, issues, how do they approach their parents? How do they speak to their parents? Because uh, there's a feeling that a lot of parents don't understand the problem and the issue. Because mental health is on the rise, the crisis is increasing. It's becoming a lot more difficult, but if when there's a generational gap, yeah. how do you approach a parent yani, that is maybe even a uh, is an immigrant from back home still has that mentality? Absolutely, and it's a very important question, and 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 definitely, and the the issue when it comes to uh, a child and approaching his parent and or her parent and want and and and, and having the confidence to talk to them and to tell them what they what they are feeling inside is 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 very important but unfortunately the reality is the reality is parenting is is one of the most difficult jobs that the human being can ever do but at the same time it's the one that we have the least training when it comes to parenting many of us as parents we are trying our best but in reality we are not good at parenting and many parents they, they're doing their utmost best in terms of offering the best way to parent their children. But we are not the experts of everything. That's why, for example, many of our parents, for example, as a child, your, your parents will take you to the madrasa because they're not experts when it comes to the Quran, when it comes to Islamic studies. They might not even have the time. They might have the knowledge, but they might not have the time to teach you. So that's why they will take you to the madrasa and they will ask you to study with the sheikh. And the same way, for example, as a, as, as a child right now, if you think that your parents, the first, first of all, you should ask your parents to, you should open up to your parents, ask them about or tell them at least how you're feeling. And if your parents don't know exactly uh, how to deal with your situation that you're in, it's important that they also seek help from the experts. And Alhamdulillah, that's why as a masjid, for example, if you are a parent and who has a child or a, a youngster or a youth or, or a child who is struggling and feeling unwell, mentally if you if you if you want someone to help you with that you can come to the masjid you can approach if the if the masjid has the solution the masjid is going to share with you or at least will that we will direct you to someone who can who can give you help who can support you so alhamdulillah i believe and inshallah ta'ala dr karmani will also be best to answer this question and this is something that he deals with day in day out and inshallah ta'ala i think he will be best to also give guidelines and guidance in this particular issue Sheikh, JazakAllah khair for that. Look, you know we mentioned the maqasid of the sharia earlier. Yeah. Mental health causes 
damage to your deen, damage to your life through self-harm, damage to your family, damage to your, your human dignity, damage to society, damage to the wealth. This is, you know, mental health affects all of these. And so if parents are not prepared to actually listen to their children, then they are doing a disservice to their children. They are destroying their life in this world. And, you know, you know even their akhirah, they are destroying their akhirah. And that's why mental health, just like physical health, is something which is core to our spiritual health, to our iman. And this is why if we do not protect the mental state, you are going to affect eventually the spiritual state. Our soul, our very existence that we are here are, is affected if we do not preserve the mental state. So this is the most important thing to recognize. Hifz al-aql, the protection of mental state is such an important objective in Islam and that we are ahead of the game. Ahead, you know, Islam was ahead in terms of ilm al-nafs, Islamic psychology. Now, point number two, let's be very honest now. Why is it that families do not want to deal with the mental health of their children. Why? Because in my experience of 30 years of working in this field, 90% of the problems that cause the mental health and the trauma in our children and the young people are caused within the family. Let's be honest. And in my 90%. And people do not want to address the issues which are in their families. And they do not want to because they fear that this will bring, obviously, shame and embarrassment. So we have what we call stigma around mental health and shame around this. And that's why we never address the issue. We brush it up. We cover it up. We dismiss it. When children go to their parents and they say that I'm going through hardship and difficulty, the parents just dismiss it. And they do. And they just say, Isbiru or have sabr or itaqullah, have taqwa. And that's not enough. You have to deal with what the issues are. Children going through bullying in school peer pressure in school, the pressure which is on them to conform to what the society requires, the pressure on them to take drugs or to engage in negative behavior. They don't want to do that. They're being bullied every day within schools. Who did they go and talk to? They can't talk to you. And I'm going to say there was a case in Bradford. I did a lecture after this boy. He was an 11 year old. I won't mention his name because the, you know, we respect the family. 11 year old took his life. He Googled how to take his life and he took his life. I won't go into the details. After that, I gave a lecture and I said, every one of us failed our son. Everyone failed our son. Because when he was at that point of being bullied in school and he was every day, they, you know, whatever was going on and he was being tortured and abused in school, he didn't talk to his brother, not his sister, not his mother, not his father, not the imam, not the teacher, nobody. We all failed him. You know the way that the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was a magnet for the children. They would, they, would attack, they would hold him by the hand and they would take him all around Medina and he would be so shy to take his hand away from them. The Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had so much what we call emotional intelligence. When Abu Huraira came to him, he read his face. This is also the skill of the Imam to, you know, I know what is going on with, he read his face. He knew that he was just hungry and needs food. Yeah, you know, SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. This is amazing. All of these principles that are given in our religion. So, look, you know, the parents need to wake up to the challenges which are in society and we need to seek help. And one of the important ways that we provide help for our community is this, maintaining confidentiality, providing what we call a safe space where they can come talk about the issues and they know it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to be disclosed to the community. We're not going to, you know, uh, do any backbiting or anything around that and to provide that support and guidance that they need to deal with these crises. After that boy committed suicide and ended his life, many people were concerned about their children. Oh, what if this happens to my child, my child, my child? And that's interesting that people have this, you know, they were concerned, is my child going through it? So it created awareness, but unfortunately then it goes away. But one of the things I said in that meeting is that, you know how you protect your child? The only way you protect your child is by protecting everybody's child. And you know, our role as elders, you know, really in this community is to show rahmah to the youth. So that they, you know, will always come to us, share their problems, share their hardships, share their difficulties with us, and we guide them and we support them and we mentor them. You don't have to have mental health projects. 90% of our problems can be dealt with just by providing a place where people can come and talk about their issues and then we can help them solve their problems. But we're not even providing, you know, really we're not even providing this. Because, you know, everything, so many of the problems, Brushing it under the carpet. As I mentioned earlier in my uh, talk, 
the drug issue, the criminal justice issue, the gang issue, the prison issue, all of, the is of these issues, just burying it under the carpet, burying it under the carpet, never dealing with it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the guidance in the Quran and Sunnah, that is explanation of all things that gives us guidance in every matter of human behavior. Allahu Akbar. So, you know, the solution is, you know, providing this in-house, in our masjid, because we know our community the best and we can provide what we call culturally competent mental health services. Services that are based on what our religion teaches and how, it, you know, what we call ilm al-nafs, the psychology model which we already have within our tradition. We need to train more people up and we will help to train people. We also want more people to join the mental health workforce. It's a good profession. There are jobs every, every, all the time, probably here in Manchester. They're looking for people in the community to play these roles of what we call mental health well-being practitioners. You should be applying for these jobs because this job is not just a job. You are helping people. You know, brothers, my staff, my mental health team, have been when someone is about to kill themselves and they're going to jump, they've been there to stop that person from killing themselves. Allahu Akbar. Allah. Is this not like the, the eye of the ground? If you save one life, you save the whole of humanity. Absolutely. I get a call at three o'clock in the morning. I'm, and, and I'm telling you, I've got a call at three o'clock in the morning. I tried to drown myself in the pond. I tried to drown myself in the, in the lake. It's three o'clock in the morning, someone is calling you up and telling you this because they want you to help them. If, I, if you saw my me WhatsApp message, how many people are saying, I'm going to kill myself, I'm going to kill myself, I'm going to kill myself, you know, subhanAllah. You know, it's, not, it's tough work. Of course it is tough work. But you could just say a few words, a few words which just help them say, okay, alhamdulillah, now I know that someone cares about me and they choose the right, right direction, you know. A few words. That's what this is all about. So we have to you know, develop the frameworks. We have to train ourselves. We have to develop ourselves to build this in-house within our communities and get the training from external as well because it's available to us as well. And, and I've got to say, this can be a very good job for, the, for, for anyone who is interested in this. I can give them the support in terms of how they can develop a career in this particular area. Last point I want to make, money, resources. You know, brothers and sisters, we have to spend money on this because this is about the well-being of our community. You know, and, we, and through this spending money, have trained people in the masjid who are providing this therapy counseling for individuals. We send money abroad. When we see that, and, and I've worked with these individuals as well, when we see that the refugees from Syria going across the Mediterranean, going into the Greek islands for refugees, as refugees, these, these, our brothers and sisters, our children, they are traumatized. They're in shock. And they have what we call mental health teams that as soon as they come off, they help them to deal with the trauma. They've seen horrific things. Now we see that in, you could say, from in, in Syria. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send his uh, Nusra and his help upon the people of Syria, inshallah. Um, I mean, um, you know, <clears throat> we see that there. But it's happening here in Mosul, brothers. I, I know that children have seen other children die in front of their own eyes. I've seen that children have been bullied. I've seen it happening here on the streets of Mosul and in Manchester, but we don't do anything here in Mosul. So we have to put some resources. We can't go to other people. This is our community. We have to do it, inshallah. And we have to find the, the money. We have to put the resources into this area, inshallah. So I'm just, I would just like to add uh, something. Jazakallah khair, uh, Dr. Karmani. And as a masjid, because one of the points that uh, Dr. Karmani has actually mentioned as a solution is like we have to provide safe spaces for people to feel comfortable to talk about these issues. So one of the things that the masjid is thinking about right now is actually to launch a safe space for parents to come together and inshallah ta'ala sit together and discuss with one another, inshallah ta'ala, as a group where they can actually exchange positive ideas and good ideas. You know, as parents, each one of us is, is doing his best to kind of like support his children and his family. And, 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 and just imagine if we can come together and each one of us can share with the others, for example, what, what things that he does with his family that, that works for him. What are the challenges that we are facing as a, as a family? And maybe one of the brothers, one of the fathers might have the solution to your problem. So inshallah ta'ala, we're going to provide a safe space for the, for the fathers, for example, for the mothers to come together and talk to one another regarding these issues, inshallah ta'ala. What are the issues that they're struggling with? How they can actually help each other, inshallah ta'ala. Different parents, different fathers, for example, different individuals, they will have different skills and different knowledges. Uh, 
types of knowledge and inshallah ta'ala we can exchange that so the masjid inshallah ta'ala is working uh, towards this inshallah ta'ala uh, the, the the provision providing this particular uh, inshallah ta'ala safe space for 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 the parents what do you think about this Good idea, yeah? So inshallah ta'ala, definitely yeah. as parents, we need to exchange ideas. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll definitely have, uh, inshallah ta'ala, uh, this system in, in place as soon as possible. And inshallah ta'ala, this is something that hopefully will address some of our problems. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all of us, inshallah ta'ala. Amen. Amen. khair, Shaykh. Sheikh, just quickly as well, I'll be running my, it's called Resilient Dads Program. This is a program I developed over two years, and it's online. And we do it on Mondays and Thursdays. And we, it's 10 modules. And I can tell everyone in this room, whether you're a father or not a father or going to be a father, this is a program which is about child development. And I can guarantee you that this program will give you knowledge and understanding that will completely you know, uh, be transformational. I can, you know, I, we've already delivered it for two years. It's something I researched for the whole two years, and it's a program. And alhamdulillah, we will offer it free. It's not a problem. It's on Zoom. We'll give the links, inshallah, to Sheikh Muhammad. And anyone who wants to join, you're welcome to join, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah, yes. Inshallah, sounds amazing. Uh, uh, we, we need solutions. We need solutions, not just talks. So the Sheikh needs to show off for these uh, yeah. parent meetings, inshallah. <laughs> And it's an open invite, inshallah, whenever these, this program launches. And inshallah, this is one of many steps I'm sure the masjid is, <coughs> is uh, considering taking. And if you are someone that works in the profession and have any ideas, any suggestions, then you always have uh, the masjid management, mm -hmm. our Sheikh, Sheikh Muhammad Ali, you can approach mm -hmm. with these ideas, inshallah, so that we can find a collective solution. But one of the questions I had, Sheikh, is that you mentioned that Islam led on uh, psychology and Islamic psychology for a long time. But nowadays you feel like that the Muslim community isn't doing enough and there's always complaints and we received some of the questions that a lot of people's struggles are being brushed under the carpet and people are saying, look, mashallah, he's listened to Quran and his Quran's affected him. It's improved. So definitely it has to be a, a, a spiritual issue Sorry. in his Sorry. ruqya rather than it being a mental health issue. What's the answer? And does Quran even affect and impact mental health? Yeah, yeah. So uh, look, our deen and following the deen of Allah and all aspects of the religion following Islam completely as a complete model and having that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we know this attending the masjid being in a, a community of brotherhood and sisterhood where there is this akhuwa, this love and this support and this ta'awan of one another tanasur, helping one another and there's this, this, in this love between each other as brothers you know the salah the, even the acts of salah we know this has a powerful you know, effect in terms of well-being our religion obviously is, is a complete way of life which gives us guidance in every aspect of our lives which helps us to rectify our lives and to deal with underlying root causes. Alhamdulillah, it's perfect, it's there. But it's not enough just to say ittaqullah and that the person is already... You have to provide the whole support. You have to provide this support and this whole package towards people. And sometimes we dismiss it. And the reason we dismiss it is, and, and brothers, let's be very honest as well, you know, and I always give this example, if someone has a physical problem, yeah, let's say that they break their arm, the billah, and they have an, they put a cast around it, and all of us will say, oh, don't touch this, don't touch this, we have to play, we will write nice words on this. And we will, you know, go and visit that person because they're ill and they have a break and things like that. When someone has a mental health or a mental trauma and things like that, the scars are here. And we are opening them all the time. You wouldn't go up to someone and, and, and hit them on the broken hand. But we are injuring them and we are re-traumatizing them and we are making their problems even worse. And when we see people who have mental health difficulties, what we do is that we say, oh, let's leave this person. We, we run away from this person and we stigmatize this person. This is not the way of Islam. When the Prophet Salah, when the woman came to the Prophet Salah who had epilepsy, this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, she is Ahlul Jannah. He said, this is a woman of paradise because she had suffered with her epilepsy. He diagnosed epilep an epileptic condition. He didn't say he was Ain Sihr or Jinn. He said, this is epilepsy. And he made dua for her, for her cure to be cured or to, for her to be helped in this matter. Today, unfortunately, the people have forgotten the amazing tradition and the knowledge that we have, which recognizes, you know, the, 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 the faculty of Aqal, the, the Jism and the Ruh and that each of them have their own ilaj, their own cures, their own diagnostic tools and everything else. Within psychology, we have the film, the, the, we have our own model of Islamic psychology called ilm al-nafs, okay, which is the knowledge of the, of the soul because we recognize the three states of the soul. Amara bisu, nafsil lawama and nafsil mutma'inna. 
And this is this is an amazing model. That, and I'm not going to go into it today, but then you, you don't realize that this model that we have, Western so-called psychology, is based on these teachings that we have had for 1,400 years. The Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself yes. went through Amul Huzn, one year of sadness and difficulty. And he spoke about his Huzn. And, he, and the reason he did that is because he told us, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about emotional control and emotional resilience. He's saying that if you are going through Huzn, the, 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 the heart it feels sadness, but the tongue should never utter that which is displeasing to Allah. Now, through this hadith of the Prophet, Sallam, the eye sheds a tear, the heart feels huzn, but the tongue, the Prophet is teaching us a diagnostic tool. What is that diagnostic tool? Someone's going through emotional difficulty, and, he, he, and it's all right for him to say that because the Prophet said that the heart is feeling huzn. He told the people. He, you know, he didn't feel like today, we men, oh, I can't tell anyone, I have to be tough, I have to be strong, I can't tell anyone I'm going through difficulty. The Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the greatest man to walk on the face of this earth, he said that he was going through huzn. This is no embarrassment, no shame. And the reason is because he doesn't want people to make it worse or, you know, compound this. But then he told us that do not let the tongue utter that which is displeasing to Allah. Now the point of it is this, today, the main reason, as I've said repeatedly today, that we, our youth are leaving Islam is they're going through huzn, they're going through psychological disorders, mental health difficulties and problems. We do not support them because we don't even allow them to talk about it. And guess what? And they feel displeased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They feel displeased with Allah. And do you not hear this statement? Why is Allah doing this to me? What kind of Allah is this that allows this to happen? Why did Allah cause this to happen to me? Do you not hear these statements? I hear them all the time. Because their tongue is uttering that which is displeasing to Allah. Because we didn't come and provide them the mental health support when they needed it. Can you see the point of how this is a diagnostic tool? That the, the, the hadith is saying, say you are going through difficulty. Then you get the ilaj, the cure. And the cure is there, alhamdulillah, in our religion as well. And then that allows you to stay within the balance of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sakallah khair, Shaykh. The final thing I wanted to kind of open up, or just an opportunity for both, because we've had a few requests from both mashayikh, is that do you have any piece of advice for someone that is struggling to cope? And do you have any piece of advice for someone that is supporting someone that is struggling? Allahu Akbar, yeah. The, my, my short piece of advice. You know, the struggle that you are doing, Allah knows your struggle. Allah really, and, and you know, I want everyone here to realize, you, you look at somebody and you think they're okay. You don't know from the beginning of the day till the end of the day, the struggle that they've been through. As I said earlier, mothers are crying. I haven't got money to feed, get my shoes for my children, the cost of living. I'm not gonna pay my bills, my gas bill, blah, blah, blah. they're struggling every day. And then we're just not even recognizing it. Their struggle, and I want to say to it, those who are struggling and going through this hardship and their difficulty, and yet they still try to stay upon Salat al-Mustaqeen, Allah loves you. Allah is so pleased with you. Allahu Akbar. And you are better than us. Because we didn't go through the hardship and difficulty that you have. So that's the first thing, that you're going through difficulty and you're still trying to stay upon Islam and you're still trying to do ittaqullah mustata'atum as best as you can. Allah is so pleased with you, alhamdulillah. And keep on struggling and struggling. And our role is what? To show you support, to help you. And not to judge, not to label, not to stigmatize, not to make them feel terrible, worse, but actually to, you know, that, as I said, that physical help that assistance, and that rahmah. This is the way of the Prophet as we know, He is a mercy to all the worlds. And this is the most powerful way we deal with mental health problems. Let me tell you, the most powerful way we deal with it is showing people rahmah, mercy and compassion. And when you do that, their heart connects to you. They, and if they don't get it from us and they get it from other people, guess what? The heart naturally connects to that. Naturally connects to that. And that is what is happening with the youth at the moment as well, inshallah. MashaAllah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. JazakAllah khair, Dr. Karmani. And also I want to thank, MashaAllah, Ustaz Ubaidah and Hafizahumullah. JazakAllah khairan, MashaAllah, to our wonderful brothers and sisters, our audience, the congregation that uh, here and those who are uh, watching us uh, live. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you all from all harm. Allahumma ameen. Amen. And I know now it's, uh, the Isha time has entered and uh, people are here. Alhamdulillah for Salat al-Isha. And uh, our uncle is waiting for the Adhan. 
and I think what was said by Dr. Karmani was more than uh, enough. I just want to say to all of you, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, protect you in this life and the next life, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you with good siha in this life, and inshallah ta'ala the next life, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our good deeds from us, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make as those who are used for, 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 for to do the good and, and inshallah ta'ala those who also uh, forbid evil jazakumullah khairan i'm just gonna yeah i think subhanallah there were a lot of questions that yes. came through the form yes. so sheikh i want to get a commitment from you am i going to get one hour for your time so we go through all these questions inshallah <laughs> we'll see that <laughs> no, no, this, i need the commitment sheikh the <laughs> yeah, brothers yeah. and the we'll, sisters we'll, are waiting we'll, we'll see that inshallah so inshallah well, this we'll, is you've heard from we'll, the sheikh we'll see that inshallah i'm going to try to to hook, get hold of him for one hour this week inshallah we'll record all of his answers jazakumullah khair tomorrow once again after salat al-dhuhr we have the two workshops islam and lgbt then raising righteous children as mentioned there was only five or six places before the talk and I've seen a few sign-ups come in so inshallah if you haven't signed up then please do try to sign up and maybe even come tomorrow at Dhuhr if some people have dropped out last minute okay. there may be a place for you and then after Salat al-Asr we have four important talks from Brother Yusuf Patel or Ustad Yusuf Patel Sheikh Abu Taymiyyah and Sheikh Abu Usama and a Dr. Sajid Umar and then there's a panel discussion discussing the challenges of the West after Salat al-Maghrib tomorrow so make sure you're there and no excuses of work it's a bank holiday Monday inshallah <laughs> so we'll see you tomorrow Jazakumullah khair and may Allah Azza bless and reward all of the attendees and all of our mashayikh Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Barakallah feekum wa jazakumullah khair